The first time I played Hollow Knight, I was an oblivious bean. I started in a town called Dirtmouth, and from there jumped into the deep, dark, twisting roads of Hollow Nest. I explored the area for a bit and stumbled across a boss room. Not gonna lie, I did die a few times, but when I finally defeated False Knight, objects started flying everywhere and filled the whole screen. <laughs> That's when I knew I had just defeated a boss. Those objects on the screen were particles, and they exist in nearly every video game. They add so much flavour and make the game feel more immersive. Without particles, a game can seem dry and flat. So what actually is a particle system? It is a game object placed somewhere on the screen, which creates a new sprite every so often. These sprites can have a velocity, acceleration, scale, lifespan, rotation, and an alpha range. Putting all these things together creates a shower of particles. Let's jump into my game engine and code it. To code this, we need to make two classes, the particle system and the ever so magnificent particle. The particle system holds data like the starting position and lifespan of the particles. This is the mother of the particles, which creates particle babies to spit out. Although these particle babies usually only live for 1 to 5 seconds. So let's get cracking. I will be using my 2D camera component in my previous video, so take a squiz if you haven't seen it. I'm going to put my methods on the top, and my variables on the bottom. Let's firstly chuck our starting variables for our particles, such as our starting position, velocity, acceleration, and lifespan. These are checked in public, so they can be changed at any time by another class. The most important thing a particle system needs is to hold the list of particles. Otherwise, how does it know where its particle babies are doing? So let's create a quick particle class. In my particle system, a particle is not an entity, or my definition of an entity. I don't need particles to collide with each other or the environment. So what does a particle need? Its current position, velocity, acceleration, age, and lifespan. So I'll chuck those under private. There are two ways to draw a particle to the screen. The first way to, is to have each particle hold an image and draw that image to the screen each frame. This means for each particle, it needs to hold an entirely separate image. If there are five particles, there are five images saved. However, what we will be doing is only using one image. This image stamps itself across the whole screen depending where the particle is. This way we are saving ourselves on precious memory. This means that I'll put the sprites we are using for the particles in the particle system rather than the particles itself. The constructor for the particles is where each value will be set. These particles do not need to be changed by an external class while the particle is alive. Two methods I'll add to the particle is process and life left. The process methods change the particle's value every frame, and the life left method returns how long the particle has left to live. Not many things need to be added to the process method. We need to increase the age of the particle by delta time, which is simply how long that frame took to run, along with the update to the velocity and position. Now we can put the particle box in a box and leave it for now. Back to the particle system. Let's actually start getting these freaking methods down. So the three methods we'll be using are initialize, process, and draw. Initialize runs when the particle system is created, process runs every frame, and draw draws all the particles onto the screen. Another thing we'll add is a list of particles. So we can actually look into the box and particles and see what's inside. Let's start with the initialize method. The purpose of this method is to simply note what sprite we'll be using for each particle. If we refer back to Hollow Knight, this would be the little orange blobs coming out of the ground. The process method gets a little bit meatier. We need to do two things. Loop through all the particles and process them, and also check if we need to spawn more particles. So let's spawn some particles. This gets kind of confusing, so let's give an example. Let's say I set particles to spawn once every second. Does this mean I get particles to spawn exactly every second? No, you silly bean. Computers work in loops. 
they can only loop so fast. Let's say this loop runs every 0.3 seconds. Then once the loop finishes its fourth cycle, it has passed one second, but in hindsight, it took 1.2 seconds. But wait, there's one more issue. What if the loop takes a whole 3 seconds instead of the standard 0.3 seconds? Then by the time it finishes, should it spawn one particle? Nah gee, it should spawn three particles. So what does that mean? We need to keep track of how much time has passed to see if it has exceeded the particle spawn speed or not. Just like the 0.3 second example. So back to the code, let's create a new float called time elapsed. Every frame we add delta time to the time elapsed. Delta time is simply how long it took the loop to do a full rotation. Then we check if the time elapsed exceeds the spawn speed. If so, we create a new particle with its starting position, velocity, acceleration and lifespan. Then let's add it to the list of particles and reset that time elapsed. What if the loop takes 3 seconds to cycle through when the spawn speed is 1 second? Then we need to spawn 3 particles, not 1. So let's turn this if statement into a while loop so that it can spawn multiple particles in the same frame. The next hard part is looping through all the particles. Not only do we have to loop through all the particles, but also check if any particles should be dead. This means checking if the age of the particle exceeds its lifespan. Now I'm going to be using an iterator to loop through all the particles. It's yuck, I know, but there's a reasoning behind it. As we loop through all the particles, we might find one particle which needs to be removed from the list because it is dead. There are two ways of doing this, using the remove function or the erase function of the list class. With the remove function, it will loop through the whole list to find the value to remove. This means we'll loop through the list of particles, find the particle to remove, then loop through all the particles again just to find that one silly particle. Instead, we're going to use the erase function, which takes in an iterator. Since an iterator is the reference of an object, it can simply remove that reference from the list. This way, it is much more efficient. So let's make the iterator and keep looping through until there are no more particles in the list, or we are at the end of the list. Then we process the particle, then check if the life left is less than zero. If so, we delete the particle and erase it from the list. If this does not happen, then we move on to the next particle anyway. Now let's move down to the draw method. This method simply loops through all the particles and puts all its data into the default sprite in the particle system class. Once these values are updated, it stamps the sprite onto the screen, then moves on to the next particle. Let's take a deep breath, step away from the keyboard and hit run. Bruh, let's actually put a particle system in our scene first. I'm going to make the particle spawn at 500-500, have a lifespan of 5, spawn speed of 0.1, a velocity of 100-100, an acceleration of 0-100, and a scale of 20. Let's process and draw the particle system. And let's run it. The particles spawn and move across the screen. However, if we were to close the application, we get a mammoth load of memory leaks. This is because all the particles that are left on the screen are not being deleted. So let's make a new method in the particle system class called remove all particles. This loop is almost identical to the process loop. I'll call the method in the destructor. This is the method which is called when an object is deleted, aka the particle system class. Let's run it and see the difference. No memory leaks. This may seem like our particle system is finished, but no. We still need to randomize particle direction, randomize particle position, and change the scale, alpha, and rotation over time. So let's start with the randomizer. Currently, for the position, all particles spawn at one point. Let's change this to spawning in a box, where a particle could theoretically spawn anywhere inside the box. To do this, we'll keep the initial position variable but also add a particle boundary variable. The new variable will determine how large the width and height of the box is. So in our process method, where we create a new particle, I'll set the position to be the initial position, plus a random float from 0 to 1 multiplied by the particle boundary. <sighs> ah, take a deep breath. 
Back in the main scene, I set this particle boundary to 50, 50. When I hit run, you can see the particles spawn in a box where the width and height of the box is 50. For the random velocity, I'm going to remove the initial velocity variable and replace it with the min initial velocity and the max initial velocity. The particle will randomly pick any point between these two variables. In the process method, I'll set the velocity to the min velocity plus a random float from 0 to 1 multiplied by the difference between the min velocity and the max velocity. I'm going to set this to be between minus 100 and 100 on the x coordinate. Running the program shows the particle spawn at a random velocity. Now for the tricky part. We need to make the particles decrease or increase its variables over the course of its life. For example, have the particle spawn at its maximum size, then slowly decrease it by the course of its lifespan. For this, we're going to create a enum. Now this enum could be none, linearly increase, linearly decrease, quadratically slow increase, quadratically fast increase, quadratically slow decrease, or quadratically fast increase. On these six graphs, the x-axis is the time the particle has left to live, and the y-axis is the variable we are changing. To make these equations isn't too hard, we just need to write linear and quadratic equations that are x equals 0 or 1 is the lower or upper bound of the variable. I've worked out these equations and are on the screen. Feel free to work this out, it's a fun time. Next, I'll convert these equations into code. I'll put them in the inline helper. Another method I'll add is the round within bounds method, which takes the value and two bounds. Then it rounds it to the nearest bound if it exceeds the bound. With that done, the last step to do in the particle system class is create the new changing variables. This includes max and min scale, initial rotation and rotation speed, and the max alpha. Then when we create a new particle, let's pass these new parameters to the particle. So I'll add these variables to the particle class and change the constructor. The last step is to ensure these variables are changing. So I'll first change the rotation by the rotation speed in the process method. Then the last method to create is the change attribute method. It takes in an attribute to change, the maximum that attribute will get to, and the type of change. The first thing to do is find the percentage of life remaining. We can do this by getting the age and dividing it by the lifespan. Then I'll make a switch and have each attribute equal its updated value. Now the last thing to do is add this feature to the main scene. Let's set the max scale to 20, min scale to 0, rotation speed to 100, and set the scale over lifetime to be a linear decrease. One thing I've got to add is to stop, start, and pause the particle system. This can be done by adding an isActive and isPause boolean to the particle system class. Firstly, the particle system should only spawn more particles when it is active and is not paused. Then it should only process slash move the particles when the particle system is not paused. Then let's create a start, stop, and pause method which changes these variables. I set each method to a key on the keyboard. You can see that the particles decrease in size as they are alive. We are finally done. I'm doing a full C++ game engine series. In this video, I talk about how 2D cameras work. You probably saw me use it in today's video, so check that out if you want to learn more.